thanks for coming, everybody. Sorry it's so formal up here. We really mean this to be more of a conversation as we kick off uh, the first public meeting for um, the Orange Playground Committee. Um, so just a little bit of background on, on this project. It's um, the town of Orange applied for a small economic uh, assistance program, and um, that was awarded $300 for the construction of a new playground in town. Um, and the town organized a five-person steering committee to lead the planning, public outreach, and design and construction um, for the new playground at Fred Wolf Park. 300,000, what did I say? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we're going to go around who we are. Um, myself, I'm Travis Ewan. I am a landscape architect. Um, I am a resident of the town of Orange. Um, I've worked on major public park projects throughout um, the Northeast, um, especially in New York City, and a few mis municipalities throughout Connecticut. Blair, do you want to go? My name is Blair Pierce. I am a resident of Orange. I grew up here, and I have a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old, and I am the mom on this committee with the young kids getting this all together. Sorry, I'm new to, I'm new to this. Uh, my name is Marissa Azarisi. Um, I'm on this committee as a uh, assistant principal from a nearby town. I also live in Orange. I have two kids who go to Peck. And I actually live um, very short walking distance from Fred Wolf Park. So it's exciting to be a part of this project. Good evening, my name is Charles Flynn. I live on Ridge Road. I'm a teacher and a realtor here in town, and I'm also a member of the Orange Board of Ed and uh, the parent of three very interested members of the public to have a playground here in town. Hi, I'm Lynn, I'm Lynn Plaskowitz. I grew up in this town. I worked on the very first community playground we had in this town at Muriel Tracy School. I also work for the Park and Recreation Office. I'm a grandmother and a lot of interest in this playground. So thank you, welcome. Thanks guys. Um, so part of our purpose here is to create a destination playground for all ages and all abilities, inclusive of all, of all people. Sure. Um, there we go. How's that? Okay. So, um, and we want, we want this playground to reflect the town of Orange and and reflect the strengths in our sense of community. Um, also part of, the, part of in this development is really to engage with residents. So it's to engage you all and hear what you think and hear what your ideas are. So we're coming to you with ideas, but it's really an open forum to start to, to look forward to the future of, uh, of having a year round playground. Um, and then, and then this, this, this playground design is really kind of a master plan at this point where um, we don't have every little detail figured out, but it's, we're, we're opening it up for ideas and, and how we really can, um, we don't want to inhibit future growth of the park. So um, one thing that we won't be talking about as part of this project is we don't have restrooms as part of this project. We don't have lighting, um, no splash pad, unfortunately, due to infrastructure, infrastructure being piping, um, electrical, all those things that would make up a splash pad, drainage, and so forth. Um, so all those things would really affect utility costs, but um, we're really excited about uh, presenting to you. So those of you that don't know, which I'm sure that's nobody here, um, Fred Wolf Park is, is located um, in, the in the heart of town. Um, the, uh, the location that we are currently looking at right now is, um, was formerly the wooded lot um, in the original master plan, that area was shown as having um, some tennis courts and a parking lot. So um, we're not, we're, we're keeping within the, the use of the original vision of that master plan, hopefully. Um, and then these are just some existing photos of the site today. There's been some, there's been some clearing, there's been some grading. Um, and then there's been some, some, some rework of the roadway area. So some of the ideas as our, as our committee has gotten together and um, over the last two months we started in, well, more than that, we started in April. Um, so we've been, we've been meeting on a weekly to bi-weekly basis, um, pulling together uh, John Hollerback from Miracle Playgrounds, um, an equipment manufacturer. 
um, that's worked on Pease Park and, and some others in the area. So um, we wanted to start with an overarching idea and have some, some design goals that we could, that we could reach for. And, and some of those original ideas, we talked about nature-based play. So having not just equipment, but things where there's a little bit sense of risk. This site was once um, an orchard, and there's the traditional New England boulders everywhere, as you could see in those uh, existing site photos. So we want to harness some of those native elements to our town and organize those in a way that children can have an interesting and, and, and vibrant and fun way to play. As I stated before, we also want to create an inclusive playground. So that's children with disabilities um, and from all walks of life that can easily move around and really be engaged and have playful elements that, uh, that's meaningful. And then we talked about this idea of path as play. Um, there's not a lot of places for kids to learn how to ride their bike in the town of Orange. So, and this is really served during the COVID pandemic after you know, being at soccer games on the weekends and seeing kids ride their bikes to uh, Fred Wolf Park. So we kind of see this kind of succession as kids can learn to ride in this area, then eventually uh, you know, move on and become teenagers and, and hopefully take their bikes to their lacrosse or soccer games. Um, and so just getting into some of the conceptual ideas, um, if you're just to orientate yourself a little bit, there's the entrance um, to the park, the current entrance off a of hollow. Um, this, this, this concept sketch shows a little bit of a reworking of that existing parking lot to try to start to give some organization to it. That's not necessarily the funding that we have for this project, but it's important to think about. Um, there's also the roadway that's coming from um, what, what is the lacrosse fields and, and how can we slow traffic down at that point, create a stop point so that people have to stop and look. Um, and then the playground itself, we see this as like a central hub where there's a, a major, piece of, um, major piece of equipment in the center of it um, and, and then there's these kind of peripheral pieces off that, that spoke out from it. And, I think, uh, Marissa, you had a really good point, is when you're at a playground, you usually have kids of different ages, so you want to be able to keep, keep track of them, and I think we think having this kind of central idea of a, of a hub and spoke uh, playground would work really well. And so one of our other organiz organizing features is having this, um, this ring around the outer, outer portion of it, so um, if, if grandparents come and they want to they get a walk-in, or parents come, or kids want to learn how to ride their bike, this would be roughly a 600 foot loop, so that's about a tenth of a mile, so you could do a couple of laps and get your steps in that way. Um, and then as we move on, uh, some, of the, some of the other ideas we had was creating this um, you know, boulder field that could have boulder engravings of, of townspeople's names that want to uh, donate or fundraise for this, um, and then really keeping um, that central organization. So as we start to get into these more 3D perspectives that um, Miracle Playground helped us with, you can see the central organizing element, which um, has an abundant of play value, um, where none of these colors are set in stone. It's just a first pass at trying to create an organized plan. Um, and so we have we have play groups for, we have play equipment for older children, such as the central element. We have play structures for younger kids and kids of special needs with ramps structures to get up um, and above the ground level. Um, we're proposing about eight swings, um, with two of them being accessible. And then we have a series of uh, climbing equipment and um, spinning equipment. So these are some more detailed views of what some of this may look like. That's the central structure. So the way that this is, is organized is it's two towers, obviously, um, a, a big, fun slide that kids can get down. And then there's um, areas for children with disabilities to get on, to, get on and off the slides. And then like I said before, we have a grouping of swings similar to what's at um, Mary L. Tracy School. It's about the same number of swings. Um, so we want to make sure we have, we have enough and uh, open to your thoughts on that. 
And this is a look at the spinning structure along with our uh, idea of having ADA accessible play area. And just to the left is a sensory play area for children with other types of disabilities that aren't necessarily mo mobility based. And so with that, um, we'd like to open up your thoughts, get, share your thoughts and ideas. Um, we have a podium up here if you'd like to um, make any suggestions or if you have any concerns, we'd, we'd love to hear it. And, you know, if, if not, um, you know, what we're, what we're looking to do is incorporate any feedback we get in a public forum like this. We're going to have another one in about a month's time, depending on what the vacation schedules are like. Um, but we want to keep progressing this forward, um, making sure that we're reflecting your feedback and, um, and then start to potentially get some earthwork done in the fall with maybe a spring, spring opening. Uh, good evening. Uh, Dan Courtright, 838 Birchwood Drive in Orange. Um, I'm also a teacher. Uh, and I've been, for probably the last 10 years, uh, the guy running the soccer, uh, recreational soccer program at Fred Wolf Park on Sundays. And, you know, a, a playground like this would certainly be an asset because we get a lot of families there. The concern that I would have as the person responsible for the safety of the kids uh, in, in our soccer program at that time is that, um, is, is sort of the fact that the traffic flow is going right through the middle between where we would have children playing and then the, the little kids who would be obviously totally into the playground. And, and I know from a parent perspective, trying to keep everybody under observation would be a bit of a, um, something that would be at the forefront of your mind. So I, I appreciated their comments when you were outlining some of your ideas about trying to figure out a way to mitigate the traffic flow. But you know, the reality is that it is set up in, in, in the current scheme for traffic to flow between these two areas. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would just, my comment, I guess, is you know, my primary concern would be safety. Um, and I, I know you are concerned about that too. And it just seems like we have that fundamental problem of that, of that drive going through there. And you know, I just know from the many, many, many hours that I've spent over there that you know, while 90% of the people who are driving through the, the park are absolutely um, you know, recognizing that it's a space for children, but there are people who sometimes don't. And, and I wouldn't want us to ha create something that could present a problem for kids. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Hi. Um, my name's Ruth Friedman, 266 Courier Drive. Um, I'm here as a grandparent, which won't surprise anyone. You don't have to say that. Um, I'm so excited about this. Um, I worked on a playground like this two years ago, and I think we may have chatted on Facebook, maybe. Um, my grandson, my youngest grandson, is severely disabled with a form of muscular, um, well, spinal muscular atrophy. And the town they live in, Warwick, New York, um, contracted with a company, Playground Dreams. And it was a community build of a um, all ability playground. Um, it was um, also had a grant. I don't know if this grant needs matching funds, but they had in New York State matching funds. Uh, they raised a tremendous amount of money to match. A um, lot of corporate donors. I'm not sure if you have a plan to get the schools involved. I mean, one of the things they did do, and it looks like this one is, you know, laid out. Um, they had all the kids in the elementary schools participate in a design your dream playground. 
and then they put it together and they had a session where everybody could come in and it was a launch. It was a way to get people involved and it was also a, a way to, um, as I saw the brick um, form, I thought, oh good, more bricks. Um, but it's a great way to do it and they you know, put artwork and stuff like that. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, a thou in that playground, a thousand volunteers came together two years ago in a week and assembled the playground. Um, it launched two years ago, May, and it was fabulous until, well, about mi uh, March 13th, 2020, and it just reopened. Um, I'm really glad to see you have the sensory as well as the physical, and the other thing I, because I was a little concerned at the beginning, but I was excited to see that you're trying to structure it in a way that the all abilities can get on the major piece of equipment mm -hmm. because it's, it's certainly easier to have separate equipment, um, but it's been remarkable. It's been remarkable for the town who, I mean, my grandson's on a trach. Uh, kids come up, they ask questions. My daughter loves to explain it. And everybody learns that, yes, you can climb with, you know, swing with and all that. So the, all the work you've put into this and all the work that it's gonna take, and I did sign up to help um, when we're now to, not out in Warwick helping with our grandson, um, mm -hmm. who will take first priority. Um, but it sounds like you're doing exactly what you should do. It will change the people who participate in it. We spent a lot of time out there helping with it, and it was really interesting to see how it changed people. So you're not just doing a playground. I'm all for the safety, you know, I, I, the cars, but it's wonderful. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I apologize because I have to be at another meeting, but I didn't want to miss <laughs> this you. one. Good Thanks luck. for your input. Hi. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Nick Calcaterra. Live at 328 Holler Road. Um, Holler Road is the access road to Fred Wolf Park. I'm sure everyone knows that. Um, first off, I think the expansion of the, uh, of the park is a great idea. Um, I, one of the reasons I purchased my property back in 2013 was um, you know, for many reasons, but I did think that that was a great, um, a great resource. When I purchased the house, it was prior to the um, development of the lacrosse fields. Um, since the lacrosse fields were developed, I have seen an increase in traffic, especially on game days. I would say um, you know, the traffic is, is seasonal, so uh, in the winter there's not a lot of traffic. I would not consider that to be anything, um, any type of safety hazard. Um, when it comes to game days, and we're talking prime soccer and lacrosse season, there is um, too much traffic. Um, the park, in my opinion, now, I don't have an engineering background, um, but the park, in my opinion, for the, uh, for the games that are, um, that are being played on Saturdays and Sundays, a single entrance is simply insufficient. Um, I live probably about 200 feet off of Ridge Road, and on game days, sometimes there's a line of over 10 cars, um, cars that are actually blocking my driveway as they're waiting to exit onto Ridge Road, uh, left or right. Um, I feel that the development of this park, or the playground, excuse me, will put an uh, even increased burden, uh, increased amount of cars um, of, uh, on this road, a road that was never designed to handle this type of traffic. Um, I know back in 2015, uh, I, apparently um, Governor Malloy allocated some funds for a second entrance um, for the park. Um, that obviously hasn't materialized. Um, my Grave concern is traffic, number one, and number two, I'm kind of wondering why that second entrance has not been built, given that funds were allocated to that. So that's to me, is my, my number one concern. It's only a matter of time before someone, um, whether it's an animal or whether it's a child, I have two young kids, um, get hit on Hollow Road. And um, so that's a, a concern I'm hoping will be addressed um, in this development. Yeah, it, that, that's not part of of our charge as the playground committee, but, mm -hmm. and, and I think if you've, if you've been back there, there has been progress to, depending who you are, you think what progress is, to put a road in there. So that's sort of the next phase, I believe, is to connect out to, um, to, to, the, to the other street down there. So. Is that Oakview, or is that gonna be off of um, Pine Tree? Oakview. 
Okay. okay. How, how, how definite is that? How definite is it? Yeah. When I cut down the trees, it was definite then. <laughs> okay. So the, I mean, will that be in place? I mean, construction is going to happen f this fall for the, the playground. So the assumption. Okay. Do we have this on record? Okay. Is it, okay. 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 I go down there once a week. Uh, it's a great walk. Uh, it's a short walk for me. Um, all right. So that's definite that there is a, there's a new entrance that'll be um, in, on Oakview Drive. Okay. Well. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I wanted. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ginny Prostakis, also from Hollow Road, 327. Lifelong resident of Orange, graduated from Raceburg School, Amity, no gym forever, um, soccer mom, soccer grandmom, and so when we moved uh, to Hollow Road, having the soccer fields was something that we thought was a convenience. Um, I echo what Nick says about the traffic and the cross fields. What I worry about is, and I am all for this playground, I'm a nurse by training, I have two grandchildren, eight weeks old and four years old, they're dying for this playground, is I'm really worried about events. And I'm worried about permitting and use of these fields. Because about two weekends ago, there had to be 300 cars for a fundraising event for the lacrosse teams. And most of those people were not orange residents. So somehow, somebody needs to direct the use of this facility. I'm worried about parties at the playground, parents wanting to have parties at the playground. We should be very clear about the use of this because I, I'm with Nick. There are times I cannot back out of my driveway. And I am really worried about, there are about seven or eight children who are under like seven years old on this cul-de-sac. And while there's going to be a second road, we have to figure out how to get people to start using the second road. <laughs> but I'm really worried about events and permitting and how the park and rec is managing these fields because you can't have soccer games and a 300 car fundraising event simultaneously. So those are my thoughts, okay? Good evening, Mitch Goldblatt, 291 Drummond Road. Um, Travis, a couple questions. First of all, to the committee, thank you for your service, and I know it's gonna be tireless, but uh, thank you for all you've done so far. I know you got a lot more coming. Um, two questions. First one is the $300,000 grant, give or take, how far will that get us, or you, towards the concept you put out there and how much more money is necessary? Do you have any idea at this point? Yeah, so our rough numbers are, with our plan right now, is around $350,000. $350, so we're, we're thinking that we need like another 20% contingency, mm -hmm. but um, you know, we, can, we can get it down. We feel comfortable that we would provide a high level of play at 300, but in order to get the ring and some other things, some shade, um, you know, where it, it would be, um, it would be an ask over, you know, fifty to eighty thousand dollars from okay. what uh, the. Thank you. Can you put back up the um, the slide that showed the parking lot and the way the traffic was going to stop and turn? Sure. There you go. Um, possibly, and I don't even know if this is possible, but just in your considerations in developing this, this area and trying to uh, possibly uh, address the concerns that were brought up before from, from soccer, and I've heard it before. If you come in from Hollow Road there, is it possible to then take a right-hand turn to go around what would be the lower side of that picture? You know, some, some squaring off so you have to stop, and then back around to get the lacrosse and back around, and then somehow connect the green space that you have with the uh, playground to the green space that would have soccer. 
So you would have an ability, not 100%, but an ability to get people to be able to cross from soccer, even lacrosse fields, without having to cross a road. Um, you know, it might be another way of engineering it. I'm not sure the topography and what else is planned, but you say you're in the beginning concepts of this, so I'm yeah. hoping that you can take a look at that potential and maybe solve part of two problems. One is, I understand, you know, if you just keep the traffic flow the way it is, you've already started to address that. You've got people not speeding, but going faster than you'd want to see in that area. This way, you're squaring things off, forcing people to stop, and also trying to have a find a way to connect the green space without the blacktop in between, if possible. Mm -hmm. That's my suggestion. But thank you very much great. for your service. Appreciate thank it you. in this great opening. Yeah. Good thoughts. So I just want to, um, I know someone else is coming up, so I'm just going to speak really briefly because you had mentioned it. Um, the fundraising is, is a piece of this we're, we're hoping to explore more. The $300,000 grant gives us bare bones playground. I mean, we get the a couple structures. Um, there's a lot of prep work that needs to be done, uh, mulch, um, rubber padding. I mean, there's all kinds of things, and that's really where our $300,000 Where we want to do is we kind of want to bring it, we want to add more, as many features as we possibly can, and that's why we really want to fundraise. Because this could be like the best playground in town and the best playground in the area. It's so exciting to see, to work with John and this team and to really see where this can go. And the more we can fundraise, the best we can make it for our kids. And that's really what we want to do. So um, there'll be more information going on the fundraising um, and all the different things we're doing. So I appreciate um, you asking about it because it is a big piece of this because we really want to add those natural features which are not part of the budget. We really want to put in benches and picnic tables, which are not part of the budget. Our task was build a playground. So that's our 300,000. So all the little extra, the canopies, sitting areas, all that kind of extra stuff is what? Fencing. Fencing. All that is our fundraising. So as more we can get fundraising, the more we can add to the playground itself. So I just wanted to mention that. Hi, I'm Janet Lingdahl at 596 South Greenbrier Drive, Orange, Connecticut. I want to thank this committee for the work you're doing on the playground construction. But what I want to express today has been said by a few of the members of the audience, and it's to talk about the infrastructure. I would hate to see you spend $300,000 without proper infrastructure for this area. We talked about a road that could go around the perimeter on the outside so you won't have children running from fields to the playground. We see this every weekend at Mariel Tracy during soccer games. Mom and dad are watching a sibling play their game and the little kids, they run off to the playground, which we all know is safe and it's fine to do. They're meeting up with their friends. This type of setup with a road and a parking lot between the fields and the playground is asking for trouble with a two or three year old running off to go see their friends. So that's my biggest safety concern, and I hope you'll consider that. The other thing you're showing in all your drawings are mature trees, which provide a natural barrier to the balls running off of a field. All that land is cleared. There's nothing left. Even the natural rock wall that was there was removed. So there is nothing left today to prevent those balls from rolling over into that road between soccer and lacrosse, and it's a big concern. I ask this committee, the town of Orange, put up a fence today. Put back the rocks today. Don't wait until you're in the fall, next spring. We have an issue today that needs to be resolved. And that's my ask. Thank you. Yeah, if you don't mind. I'm Tom Paisano, 523 Fairway Road, Orange, Connecticut. And I was there before the, the park was ever purchased. <laughs> Me and Dottie Berger thought up Fred Wolf Park in her office one day. Um, you guys are doing a great job. As Jim knows, and I know, we have 70 acres there. We have a lot of room to do a lot of good things. And we don't need to shove everything in a corner. 
what we really need is money. And Jim, we already spent a lot of that uh, 300,000. That's not there anymore. The selectman has approved large fun funds to clear land and to uh, clear trees. So we got to watch our 300,000 comment that we keep saying. That wasn't part of that. Though. Okay. So we're spending money there already. And my thought was, we need a big fundraiser. We need a lot of support. It's a great park. I'm trying to get now, I'm talking to some uh, corporate people, what can we do to truly do this park right? And that is, you know, spend the money, go through wetlands with roads, whatever we need to do, rather than, you know, do what we did at Old Tavern Road. I was involved, my kids play baseball. Every car that drove around just missed every kid that was playing baseball because that's the way we designed it. We put a, a, a field here, a field there. We don't need to do that again. <laughs> we need to think this thing out and do it right. It was a fantastic purchase. The town paid a million dollars for 69 acres and, and now it's growing. It was a fantastic purchase. It's a great place. We have a lot of land. Congratulations for thinking of this. The kids need it. We, the, the playgrounds, I unlocked the playground many times at Marielle on a Saturday because we forget to unlock it. The kids need playgrounds I, and, and it's a great idea. The kids needed a lacrosse. Uh, I donated through soccer $10,000 so we'd start building lacrosse fields. We have a lot of kids. <laughs> One was born today, matter of fact, first thing this morning, okay? Yeah, it, his neighbor across the street, but that's just how many kids that are coming. We, we have an explosion of kids on Sunday at Mariel Tracy. Uh, no less than 300 uh, cars uh, have to come in and out of Mariel Tracy on a Sunday. So anyway, congratulations, you're doing the right thing. We have a great town and we have great support. And, and again, I just want us to be talking to the Park and Recreation Department. Thank you for showing up um, because they need to know. They would be able to answer the question about scheduling games and if we got them involved. Um, some of you were involved with the Orange Kids Playground, uh, Denise Murdo and others. I was the volunteer coordinator, helped build that. What happened to that playground? Anybody remember? Park and Rec did not take care of it. They had no responsibility for that playground. The Boy Scouts did creosote it once or twice. It fell into disrepair. We took down the playground for safety reasons. We got a beautiful playground there now. Board of Ed paid for it, and it's, it's a good example. My last comment, which is real positive, go to Simsbury. Take a look at their playground. They have fencing with security so little kids can't get out. They have foam, they have a track around it. I don't know if you saw it. And they have an amphitheater uh, in next to the, uh, the playground for cultural arts. I know Liz DeLuca wanted to no donate one time. I don't know if Liz will hear and see me. Uh, wanted to, her husband, before he died, wanted to donate a cultural art building. Uh, I'm gonna approach him again. We'll see whether we can do that. Fred's passed away now, but, but maybe Liz would like to come back to town. So those are the kind of corporate sponsors that I'm gonna to try to get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, the playground we have at Mariel replaced the playground that Tom speaks of, which was a, I think, predominantly pressure-treated playground. I think most of Jim Ewan's tools at the time were on that playground, drilling or nailing or hammering something. They built that playground and all, and then it was deemed unsafe because of the pressure-treated woods and all was a big part of it and it tended to splinter more than um, the new style playgrounds and also instead of sanding and maintenance, uh, somebody, they brought in a different group, I forget if it was through the DEP or Department of Public Health or something and they de deemed it not the right kind of playground anymore for the children. You would probably have more background on that than I. The playground that's there now I actually got a grant for that uh, from the state of Connecticut also um, at the time through Senator Gail Slosberg is how that uh, playground that is at Mary L. Tracy right now was built. Um, so that, and that was 
supposed to be the community playground, and it was a community playground until Sandy Hook hit, and then once Sandy Hook hit, um, there used to just be a four-foot fence by the town hall, parking lots and all over there, and after Sandy Hook, it became six-foot fences with locked gates and the such around the playground. Over there is what happened to that, and it's locked during um, school hours for uh, safety of the children that are in the pre-K and kindergarten program at Mary L. Tracy. Um, with regards to the piece of ground with the stone wall and all, the stone wall was removed on purpose. And that was at the recommendation of Rick Capisolatro, who thought he was going to work with his friend Tom Pisano and expand for a little more soccer space there. And the fence would be put up along the roadway to give soccer more green space on that side of the road. After Mr. Pisano decided that that was not in the cards for him, Park and Rec put up a temporary fence at his request along the boundary. You can't put up a fence until the trees are cut, the stones and stumps are removed, the ground is graded, and the ground is seeded. Once this grass starts to grow, then you can put up the fence. That's another step. So, and we've already spoken with fence companies for the pricing on that. Amazingly, fence at this moment, like everything else, whether it be lumber or electrical wire or sheetrock, are extremely difficult to procure, according to both Mr. Iannone from Reliable Fence and from Mr. Cusacrio at Orange Fence. So we already are working on that because that's part of the plan. We know that we need fences in certain areas. And if you go to Wolf Park in Monroe, you would see that because they do have more frontage, but their parking is where it is and they have fenced areas to separate play areas from traffic areas. This one will have a roadway going out to Oakview Road as was planned after it was deemed by the Army Corps of Engineers that the roadway going out to Pine Tree Drive was not doable because of disturbance of more than 5,000 square feet of wetlands. And it was in, I think, four pockets of wetlands along that side, and it would have come out opposite the current Peck Lane by Peck Place School. So it was all given thought, and the Army Corps of Engineers were brought in to review the plan that was paid for $75,000 by the Park and Recreation Commission and unfortunately, what was some of laid out in that plan was not possible as designed in that plan. So that plan, while we are using some of the ideas of it, we can't use that plan that was created. There's a, more than 70 acres down there. We've acquired more property that abuts it in several areas, and there is a lot of room for a lot of use. Travis's plans that they showed me yesterday. I saw what had been designed preliminarily so far, and we've talked with some ideas that uh, things may move a little bit different from what they are with the possibility. He didn't know a length that we needed of a distance today, which I got this morning for him. I knew I was close. I said it was either four or 600 feet, and it turned out it was 495 feet. So now he has a number to work with to fit in uh, what we need. So those are some of the things that um, are being planned as part of this. This $300,000 grant that this group here is working hard on, and thank you all of you for all your meetings that you've put in and all, and uh, really this uh, uh, Charles, Lynn, Travis, Blair, Marissa, they have all given a lot of time and effort to this, and they really uh, deserve our accolades for all they've done for this. They've done a great job. But that money for that is separate from the monies we used for clearing of land and improvements of over there, the land that we've done so far. And there will be more. The lacrosse fields, the town put over $100,000 into those lacrosse fields after it was promised that we would only be putting in 15,000 and soccer would put in 10. The town of Orange alone put in well over $100,000 into those fields over there. And then we worked with a contractor to put the parking lot in over there, and we traded a large amount of the topsoil pile that was stripped off the land there where the fields are now 
in exchange for those parking lots to cover the cost of that. So there uh, was some good, uh, I'll call it value engineering, done on behalf of the uh, town and the Park and Recreation Department for that. Uh, Dan Lynch and I talk about this on a regular basis. There are other improvements coming down there as pickleball courts are in the uh, future. This playground is in the uh, future. The roadway out to Oak View is in the future. And the Board of Selectmen discussed those things, I don't know, Mitch, a year and a half ago when we voted on clearing the land and all, I believe. So there is a plan and there are things being done. Unfortunately, COVID stopped a lot of it at that time. It just halted stuff. We got the land cleared and we were moving forward with the next plans and then things halted. Well, things are loosening up now and um, that's why we're able to do what we're gonna do. I hope to see a new playground there by the fall. I hope to make sure that the other driveway, I don't call them roads, I call it a driveway, they're 32 feet wide, um, out to Oak View will help alleviate some of the problems. Is it gonna create some other problems? Yes, it will, but will it relieve some of the problems for the people on Hollow Road, which is the only access into that property, a poor access at best with poor visibility and uh, confined by wetlands on both sides of it? It's a challenge. Um, we had a better, oh, it's the United States calling. Um, we had a better drier high entrance that could have been at the north of the property, but that one was agreed not to be used. Um, you know, the, there's many improvements that could or need to be done down there. Uh, some have been done by the Soccer Association. They've invested, I think he's, Tom said the other night, a quarter of a million dollars roughly in uh, what they've done so far. And uh, I imagine they'll do some other improvements with time down there. They have their own funds to deal with as well, over $200,000. So they will probably still do some more improvements there. Um, but those are the things we're working on. That property was bought as a recreation site, not as a um, just strictly nature site like uh, Turkey Hill Preserve or the Racebrook Tract or you know, several others that we bought. Everything has a purpose. Um, unfortunately, uh, this was brought up on Facebook and the sniping began before this meeting even occurred. And you know, go to the meetings and learn but as you can see, you have very few that came to the meeting that want to learn. So you can be sure if they're sniping on Facebook, it will get an answer that you should have come to the meeting. I mean, to compare it to the purchase of Raceburg Country Club is apples and grapefruit. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Two different purposes, two different reasons. Um, you know, we're talking about a playground for children and families, and one of the charges I gave this group when we assembled, and I went only to their very first meeting, and then I said, that's it, do your thing, was my only request was that it be a playground for all, a barrier-free playground, so that we could have it available for all to have opportunity to use. Um, and they have accomplished that in plan so far. They've done an excellent job. So that's about all I can say on it at the moment. Um, I think that their endeavor is ambitious and I'm very excited about it and I too have spoken to some others about it. As far as putting a road around the edge and then coming back around to the other road, you'd kind of be boxing in the playground and all. There'll be fencing where there needs to be fencing appropriate fencing that could keep one area from another. Um, it's done at other locations and it will be uh, done there too. The largest parcel that's left of this is the triangle that would be southeast of the intersection of what would be Oakview Driveway and um, La Crosse Lane, I'll call it, over there. If you start at that spot where that new grass area is there, and go southeast from there is the largest usable parcel uh, left in this park, and there are other opportunities there. Uh, the Performing Arts Theater was supposed to be a black box theater. It was in a location in an existing building here in town. 
I was approached by executives of Subway on behalf of Mr. DeLuca. It was supposed to be a surprise birthday present for his wife, and they were putting up the money to develop the whole thing. And unfortunately, the, uh, I don't know what their title is, but the arts group at the time there, many of them have left, moved, passed on, or other, voted that they didn't feel he was putting up $50,000 initially and had uh, architectural drawings of what the front of it and all would have been and a potential layout for the interior. And the group didn't feel that $50,000 was worth the naming of this theater. So that was very unfortunate. Um, there's many people that that is their drive. And I think if it were possible here, that would have been a great thing. I've been talking with the mayor of Derby. Um, as a little sidebar to that, just so you know, to see if he'd be interested. I think it was Sharon Ewan brought it to my attention, a regional committee for the Sterling Playhouse um, up in the uh, Derby, the Sterling Opera House. And um, there was just a recording done there um, by uh, Harry Connick Jr. in February in that building and they left it with all the backdrop of the original old and the wood seat benches and all in there. It's kind of a neat building to see, but it's a beautiful old building and the outside has been preserved so that it's watertight and all. And now it's a matter of finding the funding to develop, redevelop the inside of it as a theater. And so we've been talking about that also. And that's been ongoing for quite a while now. Um, kind of, again, because of COVID and all holding off on what we're gonna do with that. So there's a lot of things going on and uh, Wolf Park is just part of it, but I'm very excited. I have had multiple complaints from the residents of Hollow Road as it is currently the only means of uh, egress to um, this park area. And we're working on some improvements that will help with that also. There will be some widening of the driveway road from Hollow into the park where it can be done. And there will be some other things, that, uh, improvements on Hollow Road that will help the residents there also. So that's all I can answer. Any questions while I'm standing here? Uh, the lady behind you in Apricot had her arm up first. So I'll, I can hear you. You can take that off because you can't reach me from there to here with your spit. So I'm and I'm vaccinated. So go ahead. <laughs> um, did I hear correctly that there's going to be additional lights on the field? She's asking if there's going to be additional lights on the fields. There are currently no lights on the fields except for when they have uh, fall fall practice and games. Uh, I think from like October on with the time change. Uh, and no, there are no permanent lights on the fields at this time. And I think that might have been an agreement way back when that there wouldn't be permanent lighting, but that was before my time. So it would require a little um, investigation, or you might speak to Mr. Pisano about that. I don't have that answer. I live on oh, you do too. Welcome. Are you connected to either one of the other two? They're just neighbors. Okay. You're down the end on the left? I am. Okay. Yes. You, I would say you have to talk to them on that. That's a, that's a discussion that they handle. We don't handle the lights. Tom and his crew handle that. So I, I can't speak to it. Lady behind you. Yes. 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 And if someday in the future there may be a third, but at this moment, that's not a possibility, so I'll just leave it at that. Yes? And what about security? Because playgrounds, playgrounds invite vandalism, as it is invite vandalism at the park today with our buildings that are there. And is there some vandalism to the structures that were there a few weeks ago? And what are you going to do to protect the schools with the $1,000? There's gonna be a couple things actually. Number one is there's gonna be some, uh, what's the right name for it, Travis? I, we said it yesterday, low 
something lighting that's like flathead LEDs, but low lighting, to, so there is some lighting around it. But unfortunately, something that I haven't even talked about with Mr. Pisano yet, I was waiting for our next July meeting, He's, you're coming to the meeting, but I think we're gonna have to put probably some sort of turnstile poles, pike poles, something like this, a gated stop at Hollow Road just in from uh, 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 the Quadiers driveway. They, the Quadiers actually own the initial entrance to the driveway to Wolf Park at a triangle there. It goes from kind of the right-hand corner out by the road and there's a big rock there. It goes in at a diagonal and there's a stone monument in his yard he showed me. And they actually own the beginning of it, but we have an agreement that's not a problem. So probably in just past his driveway, we're gonna have to consider now for the future, because we are getting more use down there, uh, between soccer, between lacrosse, between playground, all these things. And, you know, I've been down there a lot because of this new project. And your parking lot there for the soccer, they don't seem to touch the lacrosse as badly, but there's donuts in there, new donuts almost every morning. And every day I hold my breath saying, I hope they only went in the parking lot. So you are gonna see that. I was waiting till July to discuss it, but it's gonna have to happen. And then we're probably gonna have to find um, somebody. It, none of you ever have to deal with the town and some of the unions and stuff. Sometimes it gets a little challenging, but we're gonna probably have to have somebody that's a, I don't know, a $10 a day person to make sure it's closed at dusk and unlocked it you know, 7.30 in the morning kind of thing. Um, there's something we're gonna have to look at with that. Unfortunately, it's kind of a sign of the times in our area. Um, it's very sad, but it is happening. Are you two volunteering to do it? If you two are volunteering, let me know. <laughs> yeah, poor Peter. Um, so we are gonna have to do something with that. I think there was, a, there was another question I thought, no? That, I, what I will say is, I will speak to the director of Park and Rec about that, but Ms. Davis is here who is, uh, she's a member of the Park and Rec Commission, so she can bring it before the commission as a request for an agenda item to have discussion, and she would have to bring in soccer, um, lacrosse, and others to, for any sort of consideration with that. That would, that would fall under their umbrella. Growing pains, that's exactly what they are, growing pains. Anybody else for me? If not, I hope I answer, oh. So I somehow with Park kind of did something with that, right? It's only for military residents, is that more of a police thing? Or is that just something that the town that they've heard that they, I don't go there, I don't have you know small children, I don't play pickleball uh, or tennis. Um, I did go there to watch it though. I needed to understand what this was, this phenomena that they're all talking about. Um, they do allow orange people, I've been told there, but if you wanna go there, you're parking down there. And the Milford people park here right next to it is all I can speak to. I don't know. I don't. Only to the transfer station. Yeah. No, we haven't gotten to that point. See, Milford, being a community of fifty-five thousand people, and um, having beaches and harbors, and uh, these places like Eisenhower Park and all, they can warrant having staffing as part of probably their park and recreation umbrella to cover those costs. They have many, many ball fields all over the place and all. 
So they really need overseers of that sort of stuff. We're 14,000, 13,780 people, something like that. Um, you know, nowhere near the um, population or the tax base that Milford has. Milford repeatedly, and it fascinates me, and I think Mitch would have got to agree with this. If you read the newspapers when we're all formulating our budgets, the mayor of Milford repeatedly, year after year after year, is able to dump six, eight, nine, ten million dollars from his fund balance into his budget to offset his budget year after year after year. We don't have that kind of liquidity to have, you know, dumped millions of dollars yearly to offset his budget. So that's the kind of funds they have. You know, they got the post mall and all, just the taxes that something like that pays. Makes it possible to do things that we don't want. But however, we don't need a mall like that either. No. Uh, so that's the best answer I can give you on that. Um, there is more money coming. There's, we're working on some other grants uh, for other improvements. Um, I know Kristen Marquis asked about some of those things in one of the uh, commentaries, and I tried to answer it somewhat as best we could at the time to uh, give you a little more information. But I really didn't have the information as far as what this group has done. They've been on their own, and they've done a great job. So if that's all there is, I'm done. safety and all of that, and we will absolutely take all of that into consideration. But um, is there anything to do with the physical playground? Any comments or anything? So if we go forward, we know what to be looking at and what things anyone might be interested in. Yeah. Oh. She's asking if we have chosen the design. Is that what your question is? Yeah, because you, you, you two or three so we can switch things out, but everything is under budget. And as we said, basically, if I'll put this frankly, $300,000 affords the two playground structures. That's kind of it. That's sort of not really including things like swings, which we obviously are going to have, but that's where we need that extra money and that's where the fundraising comes into play. So the more we fundraise, we would be so happy to add a million things. We have a beautiful catalog. This is John over here. He has some great things. We would love to afford all of them and we'd love to hear your input. We would love to get um, donations um, from companies to maybe afford paying for a whole structure, um, but that's where we need everyone's help. Part of our, our charge in doing this is to create 
a phased approach if need be so that we can keep growing it so that we're not precluding uh, future growth in the park. So if we start with a nucleus, then that nucleus can get bigger and bigger. And so once, once we have the available funding, we know where it's going to go. We, it's a kind of a plug and play, but we're doing the planning work up front now to make sure that those pieces can be, if we're, if we're lacking in a certain spinning element or a swing element or, so, you know, I think what's going to be important out of these conversations is what's the, what's sort of the, the nucleus? What is, what is the ingredient for the basic? And as we get, as we get into this and we start doing more cost estimating, we understand where those costs are. That's when we start to make those, those decisions and those, uh, So, well, you know, a lot of times in doing these, these playgrounds is that you have the, the design assistance and the feedback from, from a vendor. And usually when you design a playground, you're not mixing and matching different vendors because of different liability issues, how they certify those playgrounds. So um, it's a pretty common practice to go with one from the design phase. But there's also excavating work. There's other work that has to be done. That's not just equipment. When you, when you size up these equipment pieces amongst other vendors, they're relatively in the same ballpark as far as price goes. So, um, you know, as, as residents of the town and not, um, you know, w we need to rely on, on expertise of, of some of these vendors to help us through this process, so. I'd also, I'd also like to mention the discount that um, from being a state vendor um, that we get. Um, so we do get a huge discount um, from using them. Um, but also we've had the opportunity to meet with Jason, who is the grant writer and um, fundraising expert over there at Miracle, um, who is working with us, provided us a list of names of companies who to contact to raise money. Um, so he's also been helping us with all the fundraising aspects as well. So not only does our contract give us the playground, the building, the layout, um, um, I think John told me that we need to bring a crane in at one point to <laughs> put one of the pieces in. Um, but it also um, affords us somebody to um, kind of gear the fundraising as well, um, which was an extra added bonus. So does that also include your installation or just installation? Installation, yep. And I wouldn't say it was a one bid process. It was a matter of looking at a vendor that's done playgrounds in the area that we've all seen and gone to. And John's company has by far done most of the playgrounds in this state and they are really, really beautiful works. So it was us that chose the vendor. It wasn't a one bid process. We chose him from the list that the state allowed. And here we are.
There, I think um, bathrooms was something we discussed from the very first beginning because I went to the soccer meetings. I know about all those plans. I, the lighting, like, so I've been a part of that for the last couple of years, kind of listening in. And I agree, I would love to have bathrooms, but again, like, just to reiterate, our charge is to build a playground. And like, do we want bathrooms? Of course we do, but like, that's not part of our budget, but is the plan, that's the hope in the future is that we add pieces, not me. <laughs> So when we get to it, we'll do it. Was that part of the plan? We don't have children. We don't have grandmas. Oh, so now, you're, now that's kind of a slanted view. You only have only have good children. Nobody else comes here that might need it. Huh. No, that is the point. That is the point. You have the money, and you haven't done it in 21 years. So please, we will do it. We don't need to rush. My turn. Yeah. Okay. It's all great, but the little outline you did didn't have street names. It had, like, somebody remarked, all little bushes. And I was lost. I didn't know what you were talking about, where it was going in, coming out. So um, I feel you're kind of putting the cart before the horse with your excitement of this project which I think is great, because I go down to Heisenhower Park to bring my grandchildren, so then I'll have it right here. But um, I think you really need to get it laid out in pa on paper with pencil so you could erase and move things, because once you put those units down, all those nice little fun things, you can't move them. And so I don't see, in listening to this whole evening, I don't see it downright, you know, on paper, where it's going to be, where they're going to come in, where they're going to, I don't, I, I just don't see it yet. So I know you're, you're so excited, and I am too, but I think you need more paperwork, more planning, more designing. So we, we, might, we might have shut down a little bit too soon, but i um, happy to, to walk through that with you. Um, I'm going to have to repeat? Is and that what you mean? What? No, so, I think we have a picture we could kind yeah, of Yeah, we're trying to bring up, bring up the plan. So oh, the way that we're working Yeah, but you is, don't have to. I think everybody's probably want to go home. But Yeah, well, no. we're, we're working in our meetings. We're working on paper, sketching out. We're, it, you know, computer is almost the same thing as drawing by hand these days. Yeah, so well, I'm, I'm using that as a yeah, visual. And, and you, you know, know what, what we're doing is we're taking that space, and we've, we've gone and, and, and we've gotten maps of Bodie Park, we've gotten maps of Pease Park, and looked at that square footage to try to understand what do they have there? What's the comparison? What's that scale comparison? So I think you make a great point, is we need to make sure spatially we're understanding yeah, you can't, what those, what those things are. Once it's you started, are, but, you can't really say, oh, that's in the wrong place now, we got to move it. Oh, no, we're in you the know. design. That's part of design. What we're doing right now, this is the first meeting we've had. So we're, we've, we've gone through an initial design process, and nothing's set in stone. Nothing Good. Is, nothing is set in stone. Good. So if we need to put labels it, on a plan, right. which it will be the next step, so maybe the next public meeting is at Fred Wolf Park, and we have boards like John brought today, and we can look at it together and say, you know, this is where we are, this is where we're standing, here's the trees, here's... Yeah, so yeah. You really better, need to see it, like you say, go right there. Yeah, and see because a, this a is, plan yeah. is two-dimensional. Yeah, and it's one thing, and to 
to then to flip it up and be there in person is yep. different. So. Okay. Well, um, I said what I felt. That and I, I also want to add, um, John knows I probably talk to you about every week, and I'm like, we want to move this year and change this year and put this year, and then he goes in and his team goes in and redesigns everything, and then he gives us a copy of what it looks like. And, and sometimes you do it ten different ways. The, and we are, and we have done that. He, he can vouch for it. He, I, I think when he sees my phone number, he puts his head down. Because <laughs> I say, we want to change this and change that okay. and move this. So we, are in the, we, are, we have been doing that. Yeah, good luck. Sorry, John. Good luck. I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. We also have, um, when we go to get our final, we can have John actually do a real 3D walkthrough where we can actually show a video and it looks like we are walking through the playground so everyone can kind of visualize it a lot better at that point and nothing will be set in stone at that point either. So. No, I have little kids. I want them to use this forever. I'm very excited for it. Um. Hi, everybody. I just want to thank you all for, for the, the work you're doing, because I think it's a great project. Um, that being said, I do just want to put into the record, although I don't have children here in town uh, as a candidate running against the, the current first selectman, um, that I do think we have to listen to residents' concerns. Um, I know it's not in your purview for what they're talking about, and I, I want to make that clear, but I think that we need, to, we need to hear people out, and if people are worried about infrastructure, um, we need to think those things through. And I don't know who that is, Jim, and I hear often that, oh, it's on my desk, and you can come talk to me, and people should know. People should know these things. And I, and I don't think saying, oh, down the road we're going to add bathrooms, or oh, down the road we're going to add another access road, these should be things that people know ahead of what the playground looks like. And you can shake your head, and I find it really rude, and I'm going to say this for the record, that you diss residents like that, that you don't even give them the opportunity to speak. I find it incredibly rude, and it's not fair to this, this group of people either, because I think you guys have done a great job, and the playground looks great. Safety should be our number one concern. Thank you. Anything? We are going to put it on our Facebook page, okay. if that helps. Um, we're going to try to put as much as we can up on the Facebook page so everyone can see it, see the visuals that we have. As we said, nothing's set in stone, so I'm sure people will have lots of comments about things that we don't have. But. <laughs> Do you want a real answer? <laughs> Half a million dollars. You guys want to help? Because we want your help. <laughs> the Dream Playground is 500, yes. Yeah, and a three hundred and sixty thousand dollar playground is is equating the available funding with potential fundraising to get it to be a a playground that can keep expanding to reach that dream. So we're not precluding by by putting something in the ground. We're not saying that in the future we can't keep growing it. Exactly. But it also doesn't take out. Let me put this part. It doesn't take out all the equipment necessarily. A lot of the cost for that is the land is things like um, the porta play that which is handicap accessible we can make it a little bit smaller you could still be handicap accessible there's a lot of concrete in this picture uh, we could take out the outer ring it doesn't need to be concrete it can be made out of something else that you can still walk and run and ride your bike on and a wheelchair can go on that's a lot more cost efficient we just have it as we said the dream playground that is what it would be I'm just a little uncomfortable with the, the term bare bones because it's not, with the 360 does not give us bare bones. It gives us, um, I think, nine different structures. The two, the big one, the big one, the smaller one for the younger kids. One of the things we tried to do is make 
um, a playground for younger kids and a playground for older kids. So depending on your age of your child, if you have a 12-year-old and a 2-year-old, that there's something available for both of them. So there's those two structures. And then there's the swings and like a, I forget what they're called. Ten spin, like the 10 spin. You know, so there's other, there's, I, want, I think there's eight or nine with the 300. I don't have the budget in front of me. I'm sorry, my computer, it's on there. But um, it gives us about nine different things, plus all of the prep work. So one of the things we had talked a lot about was we can bring that cost down by doing some community um, volunteering and community build pieces. We can't community build the whole thing because of the size and the structures. Um, but if we can get community to come in and help with the fencing or help with um, doing the groundwork, uh, we can definitely save a lot of money. And every time we save money, we can add another piece. So that's kind of where when we say fundraising and volunteering is the more we fundraise, the more volunteers we get, the more pieces we can add, and the better we can make the playground. So the bare bones piece makes me a little nervous because the 360 is not bare bones. The 360 is a pretty awesome playground. If we want to bring it to like the next level, that's where our, um, our extra 100 and change comes from. Thank you. 